Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today, in tube lab number 48, we're going to take a look at how to solder part 2. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. And soldering irons are a fire and burn hazard, so be very careful using them. And I highly recommend you find a temperature-controlled soldering station with an automatic time-off or shutdown feature. When I talk about the coming kit amps, I get two responses. The first one is, fantastic! Let me know when they're available. And the second is, I suck big time at soldering! Exclamation mark times three! <laughs> Well, I've got news for you. Almost everyone sucks big time at soldering, at first. But with the right tools and supplies, and a few minutes of instruction, you'll be ready to build your first tube amp kit, or tackle any small tube amp mod or repair that needs doing. In How to Solder 101, I'll put a link below, we look at the tools and supplies you need to do a good soldering job. In this episode, we're going to do various soldering jobs on a PCB, live, and talk about what to do and not to do, all while trying to watch the camera and not burn myself. Okay, let's jump in and get this thing a-going. Okay, we're going to use um, my brand new uh, Universal 9-pin PCB board. It was designed by my son Charles, and he uh, spent about a week working on this, and you might think a board this size is simp you know, easy peasy to design, but this is for a twin triode, the E80CC uh, preamp, in fact. But it, it's a universal board, so it'll be able to accept the 12AU7, a 12AX7, 6DJ8, um, even the Russian version, which has um, a, a few of those tubes have shields on the uh, on pin 9 instead of a, a heater center tap. So there's actually a jumper on the board to allow you to do that. Anyways, the boards are really heavy duty. As thick as I can get them, as heavy a trace, the traces are 2 ounces, nice big pads, well labeled. I think he did a great job. So, uh, normally on, on a board like this, I would put, I'd solder in the socket first. But, if we have a look at the board, we'll see there's actually a conflict and there's a jumper that would be underneath the socket. So let's just get a little bit of uh, 22 gauge tin copper wire. And let's find my handy bender. This is actually my wife's bamboo knitting needle, but they're fabulous. See the tip has these various the tapers, so you can pick the right spot for where you want to make your turn and get the right radius. Closer to the tip, of course, is a tighter bend, and back a little bit is a little bit looser. There we go. Now, take your time and figure out which side things are going on. That says the socket. That goes on the socket side, so I think I'd like the jumper to solder on that side where it'll just be... you just won't see the joint, that's all. So, push it in, hold it, Bend your legs back a little bit, not all the way down, just a little bit, maybe a third or halfway, just to hold it in place. Now, let's just make some room here. One of the key things about soldering is temperature. I like to center around 450, and then I go up and down depending on the job at hand. Now, this is a small pad, so I don't think I need to be much more than 440. So I'm going to turn it down, or up in this case. The other thing you need to know is that even though um, tips come brand new and shiny, they're not ready to solder. In fact, the tip has to be clean and tinned. So I like to use this stainless steel pot scrubber. I just grabbed a used one actually out of the kitchen. I don't like them brand new. I like them a little bit used where they're mushy. <laughs> and I just stick it inside of a an old uh, tuna tune, a <laughs> cut that backwards, uh, a tuna tin, 
Now, you want to tin it. In fact, you want to be tinning on a regular basis, but even brand new tips need to be tinned and retinned a number of times before they're actually ready to use. So, cover it with a little bit of solder, come into your, your little scrubber, twist it a little bit. Now, have a look at that. It's almost perfect. There we go. There we go. You see how nice and bright and shiny that is? That's a tin tip. Put your soldering iron away like that and keep it tinned as you work. Okay, let's put that down. Now, we've got rosin core in our solder and that'll help it flow and help with adhesion, but often that's not quite enough. So I like to put a little tiny dab of solder flux or solder paste. You just put, a, this is no clean. Just put the tiniest little drop. I use a little toothpick to do it. Just the tiniest little drop. You don't need much. You don't have to clean it up afterwards, but it leaves a sticky mess, so you really don't want too much. Drop a solder on the tip of the iron. I'm going to come in on the on the tip of the wedge, because this is a big, it's actually a big iron. You could put a smaller tip on and work it with a smaller tip, but then when you get bigger work, you're going to need to swap. So I just learned how to solder with the just the leading edge of the wedge. Come in hard, bring your solder in, test, it's flowing. Let it flow out, fill, hold for a second, let go. Do the next one. Test. As soon as it starts flowing, fill, hold for a second, let go. Clean your tip. Let's have a look, see what we've got. See how nice and shiny those pads are? It's not a blob, it's a nice flowed out bit of solder. And you can test your leads. You see how nice that is? Okay, let's get those those little prickers out of there. They are like blunt needles, so they hurt like all heck. Now normally I snip over the garbage can, but I wanted to do it on camera so you could see. Now have a look at the other side. See how a little bit of solder came through? That's perfect. You don't want too much flowing through. And because I'm on camera, and I'm trying to show you, I am probably held it for a split second too long. So take your time and decide which side the socket really goes on. Normally where the component is labeled is where it goes. So here it says socket. I know that all the components go on here and that this is the, actually the right side. So take your time, line up one end of the pins. I, I like to start with one and just ease them in. When my son was designing this board, he said, he said, Dad, I think we're gonna I'm gonna leave just a little bit of extra room on the depth of the um, of the pads so it'll be easier to get the the legs of the socket on and look how easy that went on. They don't always go on that easy. Um, now I like I like to bend them over a little bit. This gives it a little bit of a, a mechanical fastening. So with one finger holding the socket in snug, I'm going to bend over each pen a little bit. Not a lot, not like a cheap, you know, Chinese metal toy with the tabs all bent down. Just over enough that it's just holding. And what this does, and you'll do this with every component you put on a board or on a tag strip or on a turret, is you want a little bit of a mechanical fastening so that if there's some pull on the component it won't just let go. Now the solder is going to hold pretty hard and this is going to help even more. Whoops, careful you don't slip and scratch things. <laughs> Take your time. I'm actually watching the camera while I do this so it's a little tricky. Okay, let's put that down. Now take a look at this. See how solid that is? Now, you want this in even, because this, this goes through the top plate. This is very common for a PCB socket installation. So the socket will go through a hole in the top plate. And because you want this to look uh, nice and level, you want it to be level with the PCB, because that circuit board is going to go up, and it's going to fasten on uh, some mounts. So it's nice and even all the way around. You can adjust it a little bit after soldering. Okay. So let's get a little bit of flux. Let's just do a few pins here. You 
You don't need a lot. Now, because the pads are bigger, let's bring the temperature up to about 455, I think. There we go. Perfect. Drop a solder on the tip. Now these are, this is a bigger job. We've got a little more temperature. We're going to come in hard on the pad. We're not soldering by connecting up the heat to the leg. We want the pad to get hot so it draws the solder in. Fill, fill the gap, hold for a second, let go. Do the next one. I'm going to deliberately not fill this one properly so we can take a look at it. Okay, you see how the the first one, pin one, is nice and filled. We have a good a good amount of flow. And if you look over on the other side, we'll see we flowed through. Remember, these are double-sided boards. So the pads go right through the board. So a little bit of solder flowing through is perfect because it makes for a good solid connection. But look at my deliberately, I short filled this one. It probably is a good solid electrical connection, but remember you're going to be pulling sockets in and out. And if you're like me, you're rolling tubes constantly. Now that's my business, but some people spend a, a happy Saturday afternoon rolling tubes and you want that socket in there solid for years to come. So make sure Make sure you get a good joint. Now, look at the tips a little dirty. Let's clean it off. A little bit of solder on it. Now you can come back and clean up a bad joint. There's nothing wrong with doing that. In fact, it's good practice to check your joints. Heat it up. Check if you got flow. Now there's already a lot of solder in there, so we don't need to add too much more. Hold it for a second. Let go. When you hold for just that, it's not even a second, it's a fraction of a second, it lets the solder flow and fill and makes a really good bond. Now look at that. Look at the other side. Can you see? See how the solder flowed around the pin? It's a little hard on camera. Anyways, that's a, that's a good perfect joint. We've only got two pins done and it's already well on the way to being in solid. Okay, what about a resistor? Let's put R3 in. R3 goes on this side of the board. Let's use our handy little knitting needle here to, to bend R3. Now normally you're going to put all the resistors in on one side, all the resistors in on the other side. Decide before you start, what you want to do first, second, third, roughly. And then you'll just keep the same heat, same temperature. Make sure you don't mess up, mix up. Let me get that on camera so you can see. Just bend your leads over a little bit. Don't mix up your values. Do one value at a time. Take your time. A little tiny dab will do you of solder paste. Drop a solder on the tip. It's a small pad, so I'm going to turn this down. I would probably do them all around 440. 439, close enough. Okay. Fill, hold, let go. Okay. In hard with the iron. Fill, hold, let go. Perfect. Clean your tip. This will get to be second nature. You won't have to even think about it eventually. Look at that. You see, you got you don't have a round blob. You've got a nice sort of flattish mound of solder that's bonded really good. Check your leads if you want to see if they're in nice and tight, and they are. And because I'm on camera, of course, I put a little bit too much solder on, but that's fine. A little bit of solder that flowed through 
It's not a problem. Maybe the iron was a little bit hot. So if we were going to do all the resistors, what I would do is I would probably turn the iron down a little bit and I'd put a little bit less solder on the next time. Is it going to make a difference electrically? No, not at all. We're aiming for good solid connections that are mechanically in there, electrically solid, and if we have a little tiny bit of extra solder it means absolutely nothing electrically. It's just an aesthetic and actually in this case the, you won't even see this resistor because it, it actually goes underneath the plate. So by doing these first you'll, you'll gain some confidence and when you flip over and do the more visible resistors they'll go in easy peasy. Okay, what about um, something like this junction? That that's a little bit trickier, isn't it? No, it's actually very easy. Remember the components go on the side of the board that the label is on, normally. But keep an eye on how everything goes to make sure you don't mess things up. So you can see there's a nice little block showing where it goes. Now, if you have some little alligator clips around, just clip it on like that. You're only going to do one side at a time. Just a little dab of flux. A dab will do you. Let's clean that tip a little bit. Sometimes it takes a bit of work. Now that's a little bigger component, so I would have done them maybe around 440. Dab of solder on the tip. Just get it over here so you can see. In hard on the chisel. Now you're heating the pad, not the, the little leg that's coming in. Flow the solder, hold for a second, let go. Let's have a look. Now, if you made a mess, and maybe we did, you can always clean it up. Let's get the solder sucker. This These things are inexpensive, and it's just a plunger. Let's, I'll show you. Boom, that's all it is. And have a look, that's what came out of it. That's a little bit of desoldering work that I did recently. So, clean the tip, get a little bit of solder on the tip, put your plunger down. Now, for bigger desoldering jobs, they, they make you know professional desoldering stations, but for little jobs, th these little solder suckers work just fine. Now, let's get the temperature up a little bit. Come in, get your sucker in there right close. Empty it over a fireproof bucket. Okay, let's see if we can do a little better job on this connection. So, a little dab of solder. We're going to come in hard on that pad. Remember, you want to put the heat on the pad, not on the component leg, though you will touch the component leg a little bit as you're doing this. Let's have a look and see how that looks. Much better. You see how you sort of have a flattened mound filling the entire pad. Let's just pull the alligator clip off. If you have a round blob, you know your temperature is probably wrong, that you maybe don't have enough flux, that you didn't hold it long enough to heat things up. So you can go back and clean it up. So if you have that round blob, that's a sure sign you've got a cold solder joint. Look how good and solid that is. Let's just do the other side while we're here. The more you, you practice, the better you're going to get at this. I think what happened with that joint was we were just a little cold. This time we're going to come in at the right temperature, just under 450. That's my center temperature. 450, 230C, just fill, hold, let go. Let's have a look. There you go. So that's perfect. Practice makes perfect. So, to summarize, good tools, 
Not, they don't have to be expensive, but the good tools, the right tools, the temperature controlled soldering iron is really key for quality work. Good, a good narrow gauge solder, some, some paste, something to clean your tip on, some good needle nose pliers, side snips are really handy to get in close. None of this stuff is expensive. But buy good quality stuff. Something to bend over your leads neatly. You don't want to be using your finger and bending them over hard. There's nothing really that hard about this. Just take your time. Practice a little bit if you need to. And soon you'll be soldering with the best of them. Easy peasy. Okay. If you've stayed till, till now, let's, let's take a look and see what tubes came in this week. Let's turn off the soldering iron. Have a look at these. Let's back up a little bit. Aren't these gorgeous? This is a nice close mashed high testing set of Svetlana, vintage Svetlana 6550Cs. One of my favorite power tubes. It's basically a little lower powered version of the KT88. And um, and I specialize in this tube. I, I sell a lot of them, uh, mainly to Wilsonton R8 owners. And it sounds great in the Wilsonton. A lot of the KT88 tubes have, um, they have a bit of a, a flat mid-range. Whereas the EL34 has a glorious rich mid-range. Even the worst EL34 is going to have a better sounding mid-range than the KT88. But the KT88 types punch out the bass and they're really a rock and roll type, type of tube. The 6550Cs, the vintage version, um, they, they sort of have a crossover mid-range and they have a little bit warmer mid-range than a typical KT88, so it's a bit of a crossover tube. And um, I got enough of these in to make a number of quads up, which is unusual, and it's tough to keep them in stock. Normally, <laughs> normally I put a quad, finally make a match quad, and they sell the next day. I have a, quite a few in the store now, so hopefully they'll last longer than a week. Anyways, um, if you stay to the end, here are some discount codes to help you out. Remember, I've got uh, flat rate shipping around the world of twenty dollars, and if your order is $150 or more after your discount, the shipping's on me, folks. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Vows and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.